Spotlight on America presents Tainted Water. Should have never questioned that my water was the source that killed my son. It's a contamination crisis that's impacting the water millions of Americans drink every day. There's over 53,000 sites that have contamination. We carried out exclusive tests with some of the nation's leading labs and revealed what we found. Toxic food wrappers. I've been studying this for years and I'm still shocked. Nearly 100 million Americans every day consume foods that come wrapped in packaging that may be harming their health. No one's thinking, am I getting a dose of toxic chemicals just by eating this food? We explore charges that the FDA has known about these hazards for decades. It's incredibly frustrating because this is the FDA's job. Breast cancer in the military. My doctor came in and just says, this is cancer. Female veterans are being diagnosed with breast cancer at a higher rate than their civilian counterparts. Now, Congress is stepping in to make sure all women who've served are getting access to the help they need. And it's known as food for love. This is every week we get these goodies. The pandemic exposed a food insecurity epidemic across the country. Can I have this too? We shine a light on a nonprofit that's tackling hunger by rescuing food before it's thrown away and delivering millions of meals to those in need. Imagine learning that the water you drink every day is contaminated with chemicals that could be harming your health. It's a frightening scenario that may be more likely than most of us realize. We've discovered that hazardous man-made toxins have been seeping into the water many Americans drink for years. And as the EPA is taking steps to try to limit the contamination, we decided to conduct a series of exclusive tests on our tap water. What we found was troubling. You can't see them or taste them, but there are more than 12,000 chemicals that could be lurking in your drinking water, causing everything from birth defects to cancer. I think people need to understand that all these chemicals will persist in our environment essentially forever. These chemicals are broadly known as PFAS, dangerous man-made toxins that never go away found in everything from baby clothes and dog food packaging to nonstick cookware and dental floss. Currently, much attention is focused on drinking water as communities around the country are learning these hazardous chemicals can seep into their water supplies from industry discharge, landfills, airports, and military bases. So we decided to test what's coming out of taps from suburban homes and city businesses to the halls of government. Bottle after bottle, we collected samples at 11 locations in Maryland, Virginia, and in Washington, D.C., including at the U.S. Capitol and the EPA, the very places critical decisions will be made about these chemicals. In nearly every case, including at the U.S. Capitol and the EPA, tests were positive for a type of PFAS known as PFHXA. That is unregulated in the U.S., but on the verge of being severely restricted in the European Union because of its harmful effects on the reproductive system. More than a third of our samples contained PFOA, universally viewed as one of the most serious PFAS chemicals. And in two of our tests in suburban Virginia homes, the levels of PFOA were more than 1,200 times higher than what the EPA is proposing as safe. We took what we found to Dr. Linda Birnbaum, the former director of the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences and one of the country's leading experts on PFAS. What's disturbing to you about the test results? That they're everywhere, that you're seeing these chemicals essentially everywhere. So the levels are low, which is the good news, but they're still there. One of the chemicals we detected that she was perhaps most concerned about is called PFHXS. We found it in the tap water of two Maryland homes. And that one really concerns me because there are growing amounts 
of animal and human data showing that PFHXS may be every bit as bad as, say, PFOS and PFOA, and it lasts in our bodies for a longer period of time. All PFOS accumulate in our bodies. The EPA says PFOS chemicals can affect the development of babies, impact the liver, kidneys, and immune system, and have been associated with certain cancers. This past summer, the EPA proposed reducing the acceptable level of one of the most prevalent PFOS chemicals by more than 99.99%. The water that I was drinking that I thought was clean, was toxic and full of these chemicals. For years, marathoner Beth Marcasino drank huge amounts of her tap water. I ran with a camelback, which is like a backpack and has a large quantity of water. Did it ever occur to you that that water might be contaminated? Never, not in a million years, ever. Until her son Samuel died shortly after birth, failing to develop a kidney or bladder, problems that some studies have linked to PFOS exposure, and Beth believes may be linked to the death of her son. But here I am today, I should have never have ever questioned that, that my water was the source that killed my son. She believes his death can be traced to massive quantities of PFOS chemicals that were dumped for three decades into the river that supplies drinking water to more than 300,000 Wilmington, North Carolina residents. But Wilmington isn't alone. By some estimates, 200 million Americans nationwide are likely drinking water polluted with these chemicals. We predicted that in the U.S. there's over 53,000 sites that have contamination. In fact, I think that we think that's a very conservative number and it's probably many more. In a first of its kind study, Dr. Birnbaum and colleagues mapped probable communities with high concentrations of PFOS chemicals. No state was spared and some regions were blanketed. How many people would you estimate in America have measurable exposure to PFOS? I think almost everybody. Whether you have PFOS in your tap water depends on where you live. Most states have not adopted limits, leaving the most likely regulation to come from the EPA, which told us it hopes to have a national regulation with enforceable PFOS limits in place by the end of next year. Wilmington, North Carolina is now successfully reducing PFOS in the water, but it took five years and taxpayers footing the bill for a hard-fought $43 million water treatment plant upgrade. I hope that nobody else in America has to endure the same loss that I do, but I believe that with enough fight and enough effort, we can stop these chemicals from being produced. That's what I'm gonna do because my daughter and other families deserve this. Environmental groups have been warning about the dangers of PFAS chemicals for years. And as you just heard, much of the focus has been centered on the contamination of our water. But a spotlight on America investigation reveals we've been holding PFAS in our hands the whole time. Surprisingly, this hazardous forever chemical is part of the packaging and wrappers surrounding some of our favorite fast foods. America loves fast food. Every day, 87 million people in the U.S. consume these quick meals. That's a third of us. We've been warned for years about how unhealthy it is to eat all that fat, salt, and sugar. But there's another threat on the outside, in the containers and wrappers of some of the most popular fast foods in America. People may not realize the extent to which PFAS is also in food, and that one way that it's getting into food is through food wrappers. Melanie Benish is a legislative attorney for the Environmental Working Group specializing in PFAS. No one's thinking about, am I getting a dose of toxic chemicals just by eating this food? Do you think that that's an important question? 
Kevin Loria published this comprehensive piece for Consumer Reports after testing for PFAS in common food wrappers and packaging. We found evidence for PFAS in over half of the items that we tested. Including high amounts of PFAS on packaging surrounding some of the country's most iconic burgers, chicken sandwiches, nuggets, and fries. You look at some of these really popular products and the fact that we found some of the levels that we still did. It is indeed, I think, still surprising. I've been studying this for years and I'm still shocked. The results are stunning, but PFAS has been a part of fast food packaging for decades. In 1966, DuPont asked the Food and Drug Administration to approve adding PFAS for food containers. But after DuPont's own documents revealed the chemicals could harm the liver and kidney, the FDA rejected that request. A year later, DuPont lowered its estimates of how much PFAS migrates from packaging to food. And in 1967, FDA approved it. And they knew it. And they knew. They knew that PFAS could harm people. The early warning signs were there. FDA declined an on-camera interview with us, instead issuing a statement saying, addressing potential health effects of PFAS exposure is a priority for the FDA, and we continue to review PFAS and food contact applications to ensure their uses are safe. DuPont no longer manufactures PFAS, and the FDA did ban some of the original PFAS formulas in 2016. But dozens of other versions of PFAS are still being used, lining everything from pizza boxes to microwave popcorn bags. And of course, coating the containers and wrappers surrounding fast foods. It's in everything. The FDA is recommending getting rid of all PFAS in food packaging by 2025, and most fast food giants are agreeing to ditch PFAS. But there's no mandate for others to follow their lead, which leaves organizations like EWG continuing a fight to eliminate PFAS in all food containers, a fight Benish says should have wrapped up years ago. How frustrating is that? It's incredibly frustrating because this is the FDA's job. When most people think of our country's veterans, they think of three words, service, discipline, and patriotism. But for women who have served our country, they are thinking of another word, cancer. Female veterans are the fastest growing group of all veterans across the country, and more and more of them are being diagnosed with breast cancer and tracing it to their time on the front lines. Women like Jessica Purcell. My mom got to swear me in again and pin my lieutenant bars. That was really special to me. Jessica Purcell beams with pride when she reflects on her years of service. She was actually my first salute as an officer. As part of a Tampa family that always put country first. We have over 100 years of combined service, just immediate family. The only woman in her class to become a jump master, Jessica fearlessly plunged from helicopters dozens of times and served in Afghanistan back in 2013. I think I bought into this mentality of I'm untouchable. In 2018, she would be touched by a diagnosis that changed her life. Already a mom to one, she was nine weeks pregnant and 35 years old when her doctor delivered the news. This is cancer. And I am, it's like time out. What? I'm sorry. Wait, what? Did you, did I just hear that right? It was a life altering diagnosis for Jessica, but she is far from alone among women who served. This past fall, here at the Military Women's Memorial in Arlington, Virginia. The lump is right here. Veterans shared a badge of honor and survival, part of a portrait collection of breast cancer victims and survivors who have a common bond of military service. Spotlight on America dug into the prevalence of breast cancer among service women and learned that military women have a 20 to 40 percent higher risk than their civilian counterparts, according to a 2009 study published by the National Institutes of Health. Some of the possible causes vary from post-traumatic stress to long-term exposure to hazardous toxins. Do you believe there are other young female service members potentially who have been undiagnosed? Absolutely. 
I've been on the line basically to hear them being diagnosed. And again, they're young. Young, like Kate Hendricks Thomas, a Marine Corps veteran who deployed to Fallujah, Iraq in 2005 during one of the deadliest years of the war. In 2018, as a young mom, Kate got a stunning diagnosis, stage four breast cancer. Her husband, Shane, remembers first hearing the news. Did it catch you by surprise? It caught, it caught everybody by surprise, um, mostly because she was too young. She actually had someone that was deployed with her and had the exact same type of stage four breast cancer. Let's go, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. It turns out some 700 service women are diagnosed with breast cancer every year. And with women now the fastest growing population among veterans, making certain they have access to quality care within the VA system is an urgent priority. But for decades, a Spotlight on America investigation found that women veterans did not have access to in-house mammograms at VA facilities in 15 states. That's nearly a third of the country. Do you worry that there are female veterans that are falling through the cracks? Absolutely. We always worry about... Uh... Joy Elam is with the Disabled American Veterans Organization. She told us she is particularly worried about millions of female veterans living in rural parts of the country. It's hard to get good access to health care in general in a rural community. VA is no different, has struggled with this. Jessica believes her cancer was missed by doctors a year before her diagnosis, with the concern she raised dismissed because of her young age. She went through chemo while pregnant and gave birth to a healthy baby boy. Kate was not so lucky. During her battle, she fought to make sure women who've served have access to mammograms wherever they reside, and no matter their age. She was originally given six to ten years to live. She would only get four. Kate died this past April, but her name lives on in legislation inked by Arkansas Senator John Bozeman. A lady that, that had everything going for her, a nine-year-old son, and, and then this happens, it really focuses your attention on, on what this represents. Inspired by Kate's advocacy, Senator Bozeman co-sponsored two key bills that were signed by President Biden earlier this year. The Kate Thomas Service Act, allowing for any veteran who served in the Middle East to be eligible for a mammogram, regardless of age. And the MAMO Act, requiring the VA to develop a plan to improve breast cancer screening and provide teleservices to veterans who need it. The VA has, has not done as good a job as we'd like uh, for women. In the past, we're working hard to rectify that situation. Who's actually going to enforce this? Where's the, the oversight? We're working really hard, and, and these are questions that are being asked and, and, and followed up on. I appreciate the fact that you're doing the same thing, and that's what this is all about, all of us working together. Uh, to make sure that the commitment, it's one thing to make the commitments, it, it's another thing to follow through it in a reasonable length of time. This past summer, Senator Bozeman sat alongside Kate's husband, Shane, and their son, Matthew, at an event to commend her life-saving legacy. His signature is now on the legislation, displayed in a shrine to Kate at the Thomas home in Virginia. What went through your mind watching this, this law in your wife's name? get passed and, and signed by the president. It was surreal. It was one of those things where you had an extreme amount of gratitude for the fact that your wife was special enough that it, it made an impact like that, but the cost was too damn high. You could come on through, man. Outside Columbia Heights Village Apartments in Washington, D.C. Hi, Miss Ann. How, How you doing today? Residents like Aisha Wilson ponder their options on food distribution day. Oh, give me bread? some bread. Yes, ma'am. This is every week we get these goodies. For 90-year-old Virginia Marrero, what she takes home will sustain her for days. Can I have this, too? To understand how all this fresh food got here, we sat down with the person primarily responsible, Kate Urbank with Food Rescue US. We've rescued 7 million meals, and that accounts to about 8.5 million pounds of food. This nonprofit's innovative approach to tackling hunger involves volunteers rescuing and distributing perfectly good food to those in need before it's thrown away by grocery stores, restaurants, and corporate cafeterias. There are statistics that say between 30 and 40 percent of food is wasted. And when we have a food insecurity problem in the United States, that's absurd. 
According to ReFed, the United States wasted 35% of food produced in 2019. That's 160 billion pounds of unsold and uneaten food cast aside, costing farmers, grocers, and consumers more than $200 billion. Right now, I'm separating through our meats. Food Rescue U.S. partners with supermarkets like Wegmans, where Angelica Buckman works. We give with love, and we hope it's accepted with love. Moments after she packs up food otherwise destined for a landfill. Because there's a lot here. Volunteer Glenn Romero swoops in, loads up, and heads off to Columbia Heights Village. Only 20 minutes later, we hear from a grateful Miss Moreto. And I didn't have nothing in my fridge, so I'm blessed. This entire process from pickup to delivery is coordinated through a proprietary app, ensuring short drive times so nothing spoils. Some of Urbank's top providers are Washington, D.C. institutions. All right, let me put this inside. Like the Sodexo cafeteria at the National Geographic Society. I don't like food waste because we know in Washington, D.C. what the world is going through. Along with Aramark at Washington's Capital One Arena. The car is completely filled with boxes. Volunteer Janet Fershine then takes the short trip to Central Union Mission, where she's greeted by Chef Rick Snyder. How's it looking? It looks beautiful. This is good stuff. It's very hard being on the street. It's dehumanizing being a homeless person. So anything we can do here to give a person a sense of love and dignity and respect, we're going to do it. And oftentimes that begins with a meal. I'm glad we have people, things and places that people care that want to help someone. For resident Willie Wiggins, the path of compassion traveled by so many from farm to fork boils down to one ingredient. Well, it's good to know that we have a mission that wants to show you that people do love you, that you can come and get a nice good food, breakfast, lunch, and dinner from love. Wiggins reminds us that there are few human qualities as transcendent as empathy. Which brings us to a farmer's market in the nation's capital. So we're really looking at food systems from like start to finish. From like Danielle Antone works for Fresh Farm, a nonprofit that manages dozens of farmer's markets across the region. So we're able to close that loop on recovery and increase access to communities in need. We have a lot of uh, fresh lettuce, some salad greens, kale bunches. We got 23, 41 all together. I don't want it to go to waste. There's people in need. It just makes sense to do it. It's heavy. <laughs> At the end of each weekly market, Ooh. food rescue volunteers hustle to see who has leftovers, gathering boxes and bags stuffed with garden fresh produce. So someone will be eating all the vitamins. No longer destined for the trash. Oh, it's the most beautiful food in the whole city that they're donating to people in need. It's amazing. Then a handful of groups that work directly with food insecure families pull up and pack up all these healthy choices. It's the difference between food in a can and fresh food that is delicious. The amount of food gathered on this day allows Kate Urbank to reflect not only on this bounty, but the wisdom of a man who understands the power of kindness. One of the folks we interviewed earlier this week talked about food being love, and I think about that and I look at this and it, it, it really is love.